So when we began this, this whole series, the first thing we did was look at what Jesus had to say about the topic of baptism. And then we, last week we looked at the epistles and all of the important statements made there about baptism. And what I want to do tonight is I want, I want to try to help you understand that once you have been baptized, that doesn't mean that your journey with God is complete. The, devil's going to leave you, or the devil is not going to leave you alone just because you got baptized. Maybe you heard the story of the woman who was married to a real miserly husband. And one afternoon she wanted to get away from the house. So she said, now I'm going to go to the mall and, uh, and I'm going to just be there for a couple of hours. He said, well, you can look, but you may not buy anything. Well, she came back and she had a very nice, expensive dress. And her husband said, I, I thought I made it very clear to you that you were not to buy anything. And she said, well, I, I didn't intend to, but I was just going to try it on and see how it fit. And, and then the devil said, boy, you sure do look good in that dress. And her husband said, well, you should have said, get thee behind me, Satan. She said, well, I did. And the devil said, ooh, it looks good from the back, too. And the point is, Satan is not going to go away just because you did something once to get rid of him. Or to put it another way, baptism does not drown the devil. There is simply no New Testament support for the idea that once you've been baptized into Christ, that you have arrived spiritually. When I was growing up and somebody got baptized, often it was called obeying the gospel. And I think that can create the impression that, that now that the gospel has been obeyed, your spiritual journey has culminated. Baptism is not the culmination of a person's spiritual pilgrimage. It is the initiation into your spiritual journey. It is a journey that Satan is going to try to obstruct at every single possible opportunity. So when we talk about baptism, we don't just talk about the past. We, we need to look into the future. Now, the reason that I chose the text that we're going to look at is uh, Colossians chapter 3 is that even though the word baptism is not used in this passage it is very much implied it is a baptismal text it is filled with baptismal imagery about dying and and being raised and taking off and and putting on in short it's Paul's description of what a baptized life is supposed to look like so Reading from your own Bible, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, this is what Paul writes. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Now we know from some of the writings of the early Christians what some of their baptismal practices were. And often when someone came to be baptized to symbolize the death of the old man and the beginning of the new life, they would literally take off their clothes. They would, they would take their old clothes and they would throw them away. And as the person came up out of the water, they would be given a brand new set of clothes to put on to symbolize that he or she is now living a new baptized life. Here's what I want you to catch as we get going into this. The Bible pleads that you wear your baptism wherever you go. Write that down. A lot of times we, we focus on the first few steps of the Christian journey. And we don't give much attention to the rest of the trip. But most of the New Testament is not written to people thinking about becoming Christians. It is written to people who have already been Christians for quite some time, teaching them how they are supposed to live. Now, do you understand that is also true for most of what the New Testament says about baptism? In other words, most of the verses in the New Testament about baptism are written to teach people who have actually already been baptized. You say, well... 
Why do you talk about baptism with people who have already been baptized? Because even though they have already been baptized, they still have a lot to learn about what baptism means. That's what Paul and the other writers in the New Testament are trying to do. The Gospels indicate the necessity of baptism. The book of Acts shows us the practice of baptism, but it's in the epistles that we get instruction on the implications of baptism. This is how you began, and because of that, this is how you should live now. Remember when Jesus was baptized, it was literally a, a preview of his death. He was willing by his baptism to say to his father, I accept this costly mission that you are giving to me. And that is exactly what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to live out the implications of our baptism. He wants us through that one time response to start a lifetime of responding back to him. So what are the implications of baptism? Well, there are many, but tonight I just want to show you three from this text. So Colossians chapter 3, we're going to start in the fifth verse. If you want to follow along in uh, your own Bible, it says this. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now I want you to understand, as, as, as I have talked about in these three different lessons on this series, that, that God wants to do a do-over in our lives. God can give us a, a new birth. And, and when we're baptized into Christ, God says, I'm going to wash away the past. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erase those sins. But understand that baptism is not just a request for God to wash away our past. Baptism is also an expression of our willingness to accept from God a, a brand new future. And I want to show you why there are three things that future, or what three things that future is, is supposed to include. First, write this down. My baptism leads to my involvement in a new community. All through the text that we just looked at, you see phrases like, members of one body. You see the phrase, bear with each other. Teach one another. To be raised with Christ is to be ushered into a corporate faith. Right off the bat, baptism confronts a, a very popular American myth. The myth in America is that religion ought to be a very private affair, especially when it comes to our leaders in government. We, we want men or women who are religious, but they never let us know that they actually are. We want leaders who keep their religion private. 
Now, this explains why in every Gallup poll this decade, over 90% of Americans say they believe in God, but less than half of them are even remotely active in any kind of religious group, which is why Gallup says that Americans are believers, but they are not joiners. Now, baptism will not let you think that way. When you, when you look at the life of Jesus, he didn't just teach and he didn't just heal. He gathered disciples. He formed a community. He created a family. And from the very beginning, baptism into Jesus meant immediate and active participation in the family that he created. So in, in Acts chapter 2, the very first time we come across the idea of baptism in the church, it says this in Acts 2 verses 41 and 42, those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. You see, immediately when they were baptized, they were part of a family and community that they actually devoted themselves to. I honestly believe that most people don't understand the implications of baptism. A few years back, I, I baptized a couple of teenagers of a family that had actually left our church. They, they didn't leave because they were mad. They just kind of fell out of church, stopped going. They couldn't fit church into their busy schedules anymore. But they called me and they asked me if I would baptize their daughters. Their daughters wanted to be baptized. So I went and I met with them and I talked with their daughters and I ended up baptizing them. But I, I have to be honest with you, I, I really feel now that I probably shouldn't have baptized them. I know that might sound shocking, but that's, that's literally how I feel. Because I have to stand up before God one day, and I will, I will not ever let that happen again, where baptism is treated like a ritual that you just check off some kind of a list. You know, every kid at least once in their life needs to go to Disney World. Every kid needs to be baptized, too. That's how I see it. Baptism places you into a body that Jesus actually died for. It's not just a ritual to go through. It is literally a birth into a family. We have got to understand that you have to wear your baptism. You, you have to live it out. That's what we read in Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47 say, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They, they broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Church is not something that you join. It isn't something that God you know, want you to go and, and, and just, you know, check out to see how they can minister to you. Church is something that God actually joins you to. God does not give birth to orphans. God puts his kids in a family. So at baptism, you not only chose to be numbered with Jesus, but you chose to be numbered with all the other people that have chosen Jesus. So if you are not active in church, and if you're not committed to other brothers and sisters, and I would not say that about you guys on a Wednesday night because you are actually committed and you're regularly meeting, regularly praying, regularly giving, regularly being a blessing in the body of Christ. But if you're not doing that, you need to be. You say, why? Well, because you've been baptized. That's why. So wear it well. Put on the clothes. Here's the second thing. Write this down. My baptism leads to my agreement with a new equality. You see, you're not just in a new community. You're in a radical new community. Radical in its exclusiveness because we don't apologize for saying only people that name Jesus as Lord can be in our family but also radical in its inclusiveness. Because anybody that names Jesus as Lord can be in our family. The radical equality flows right out of our baptism. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 with me. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12, it says, The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. 
For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. In other words, Paul says the church is one because we all came through the same door. We were all baptized by one Spirit. Now you may not realize this, but this was revolutionary teaching in the first century because the first century was just as bigoted, just as divided as the 21st century along lines of, of race and religion and gender. If you were a Jewish man, you were thankful that you were not a Gentile or a slave or a woman. A Jew had religious advantages over a Gentile and a free man had advantages over a slave. And, and a man had religious and social advantages over a woman. And guess what? Paul said all of those advantages were drowned in the waters of baptism. Look again. Galatians 3 verses 26 and 28 say, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Being baptized into Christ has profound social implications. I know of churches that preach on the necessity of baptism and then not practice the implications in this area. I know they exist because I've been in them. I know these churches are around that will preach baptism, but they will not allow black people to be a part of their church. When you get baptized, you, you put on a new set of clothes, and things are not the way they used to be. When, when you bury that old man of sin, you also bury bigotry and bias. When you become a Christian, you join a body of believers who are to practice a radical equality that convicts and convinces a bigoted world. 1865, Richmond, Virginia. Something happened one Sunday that shocked an entire church. It was time for communion. And in this church, communion was not passed. You would come down to the front and you would, you would take communion at an altar. But what shocked everyone that day in 1865 was that a black man walked in, came down to the front, and he knelt at the front of the altar. You could hear just people scorn, not saying anything, but you could just hear the anger in their stares. And then a very distinguished white man stood up walked right next to this individual, knelt down beside him, and offered him communion. The white man was General Robert E. Lee, and his example changed the entire church. I know Christians that tell racist jokes. I know Christian men that practice sexism at work. I know people that look down on other people because they're from another country, maybe Mexico. Stop it. Because we are baptized. We have put on new clothes and we need to wear them and act like we are actually wearing this new garb. A person who has been baptized has a new community and they have an entirely different view about equality. Also, my baptism leads to my commitment to a new morality. Nobody who understands their baptism can just not be concerned about morality. Because when you have died with Christ, Paul said there are some things that you actually put to death. Like sexual immorality, lust, Greed, which he actually calls idolatry. Anger, rage, malice, slander. Filthy language and lying. You see, the only mourner of the old man is the devil. Now we have to deal with the problem that some have of misunderstanding the gospel of grace. Some will say, preacher, 
we can't be perfect. Only Christ was perfect, and we're never going to stop sinning. So, so we should lighten up on this whole call to morality. And anybody that thinks that way still does not understand their baptism. So let's just let the Apostle Paul explain it, because he preaches way better than I do. Romans chapter 6, the first verse. Paul writes, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. By the way, I don't want to pause on that. The literal Greek language literally says, hell no. The Apostle Paul says that in this text. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. A lot of people think that they can't ever quit certain sins. That is not what this says. You are not a slave to sin anymore. You are free from it. At baptism, God is not just dealing with your past. He is literally dealing with your future. You were released from the penalty of sin, and through the Holy Spirit, you have been released from the power of sin. And I believe that one of the hymn writers refers to that as the double cure. Probably the most famous magician in the 20th century was Harry Houdini. He was a, a famous escapologist. He claimed that there was no jail that could be built that he could not get out of in one hour. So a little town in the British Isles took his challenge and they built a special jail cell for just Houdini. He walked in with his tools, hid under his clothes. He said, give me one hour. Well, he didn't work for one hour. He worked for over two hours, and he could not get that lock to tumble. So finally, he just gave up, dropped his tools. He leaned against the door, and when he did, it flew wide open. They had tricked him. They never locked the door. Satan has tricked many people into believing that they can never get out of a prison that Jesus has already unlocked. I know people that are, that are staying in a bondage they don't have to stay in. The Bible says that because we have been buried and raised with Christ, the power of sin has been buried, and that means that we can count ourselves now dead to sin and alive with Jesus. Consequently, there is no greater living contradiction than to walk out in the streets of Des Moines and see a baptized Christian who is drunk. Or to find out a baptized person has been committing adultery. Or a baptized person is an incessant gossip. Or a quick-tempered father or mother. Or that a baptized man is addicted to pornography on the internet. Or that a baptized woman finds more joy in what she can purchase than what she can actually give. The very first Christians, when somebody would, would come up out of the waters of baptism, they would give that person a candle and they would say to them, You are now the light of the world. And I, I would say to to you here, to anybody that's, that's watching or listening to this message, it literally is very serious time for you to be honest and real about your morality. Put your baptism on. Wear it. We need to remember that the greatest witness is a person who has been born again. God's plan in the beginning was to send people who have been baptized into all the world 
who know how to wear their baptism. I heard a story about a man in Britain who was an alcoholic. His family suffered in many ways and literally had no furniture in their home because their father took every check he had to go and buy booze. But then that father accepted Jesus Christ and he immediately began to live his, his new life as a new person. The guys down at the warehouse had a little bit of a problem with this new man and they gave him a hard time. They said, don't you tell me that you believe all of that Jesus stuff. That's ridiculous. That story about him turning water into wine. You're going to tell me that you believe that. Now, this new believer didn't know much Bible yet. He says, I, I don't know. I, I haven't even read that story. I don't know if he did turn water into wine, but I know at my house, he's turned beer into furniture. He's turned wine into water. See, the world can, can see a new creation and resent it. But they can't refute it because there is just no denying a man in a new set of clothes. Satan is going to do everything that he can to keep you from being baptized. But if you do get baptized, he will do everything he possibly can to keep you from wearing that baptism.